my name is Queen Angela Gowden. I am 21 year old, 21 years old, and I am here today to be baptized. My name is Kayla Montgomery. I am 20 years old, and I am here to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. How I got here is because of my godparents. We came to Carers by Candlelight when I got my our godparents. I enjoyed it a lot. And one day, I turned to her and I said, I wanted to go to church with you. It changed my life a lot. And it is, and I decided after that that I wanted to give my life to Christ. It's special that we are getting baptized, but it's special that me and my best friend getting baptized too. I'm a new person. I'm a new creature in Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. You know, sometimes in your life you meet people that are just very special to you, and they mean a lot to you. And um, I've met two very special young ladies, and Caitlin and Queen Angela, and you've just heard their testimony this morning by video. But Caitlin, I want to ask you now, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Yes. It's on that profession of faith in Christ that I baptize you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. Come on, hold your nose. There you go. You did it. All right. Raised to walk in newness of life. You okay? All right. And this is my friend, Queen Angela. Queen, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Yes. It's so on that profession of faith in Christ, I baptize you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. You okay? Raised to walk in the newness of life. Okay. Church family, it gives me no greater joy than to introduce my own twins this morning, Avery and Silas Worf. As a parent, you pray for your child's salvation, and you pray for friends and family uh, to help them towards that salvation, to be surrounded by them, to show them what God's love is like, to show them what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So I'd like to ask, if you're a family member, if you've helped in Silas and Avery's spiritual journey so far, if you're a friend of Silas and Avery, I'd like to ask for you to stand to this time, Avery, the friends out here, they rejoice in your decision today. They're excited about this. And so Avery is never short on words, if you know her. She's also never short on smiles, and she's never short on joy. And Avery, your Heavenly Father right now looks down with joy for you at this moment for this decision. So I ask you, is it true that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Based upon that confession, I now baptize you in your name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in a new way of life. <laughs> Next we have Silas, seven-year-old, first grader at First Pres Day School. This is my sports-loving son. And if you know Silas, he may be short on words, but he's huge on love. And he has love for Jesus Christ most of all. And so I rejoice in his decision today. And Silas, for as much as your mother and I love you and your siblings, your heavenly father died on this cross. He died on this cross for your sins, and he loves you more than we could ever, ever do that so. So we rejoice in that today, and I ask you, is it true that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Based upon that confession, I now baptize your name with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in a new way of life. Amen. And it's what, today is what that is all about. Jesus defeated the grave. And we see that picture through baptism, through the death, burial, and the resurrection. What a glorious thing. Would you stand with me, church, as we sing, Up from the Grave He Arose.
You may be seated.
Well, amen. What a powerful song and worship service here too for. Thank you, brother and sister, and Tim and the whole team behind me for stirring our hearts, pointing us heavenward towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me this morning in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 20. The title of the sermon is Hope is Alive. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, hope is alive. As you're finding your way there, would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, this morning we gather with untold millions the globe over to punctuate this day in eternal truth that Jesus is alive. Through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, we have hope. We can face with confidence all that is before us, including the grave itself. And Father, this morning as we look at John chapter 20, I pray the truth of the resurrection would reverberate in our hearts anew. Father, I I pray we would be gripped by the power of your son's resurrected life. And Father, I pray for many friends who've gathered this day, perhaps who don't have a church home or have come into this building today wanting to hear a message of hope. And I pray, Father, you would speak to their hearts in a particular personal way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning we gather Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and we gather and we worship along with so many untold millions the world over. And it's fitting and right that this day of every Sunday in the caliber year has a particular sense of joy and of vibrancy to it. Because as we're taught in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because Christ is alive, Our hope is not in vain, our faith is not in vain, our preaching is not in vain. It is upon this great truth, the resurrection of Christ, that all that we believe stands or falls. If Christ is still in the grave, then we have no hope. This is just a charade we are going through, and we ought to get on with other more meaningful features of life. But if Christ indeed is alive, then this is ultimately worthy of our gathering. It's ultimately, he is ultimately worthy of our gifts, of our service, and of our worship. And so this morning, as we come together, we do so as a people gathering, not unsure about whether or not this man from Nazareth is dead or alive. We gather with confidence, with hope, with full assurance that Jesus is alive, and since he is alive, we have hope as well. John chapter 20, remember what has taken place up until this point. The previous Sunday, Jesus enters Jerusalem on the back of a donkey's colt. The crowd gathers. By and large, they receive him. They chant, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yet the Jewish leadership with the Roman authorities began to conspire to put Jesus to death for one urgent reason, that is Jesus claiming to be the Son of God makes himself equal with God. Thursday evening, Jesus assembles in the upper room with his disciples. He gathers, he teaches them, and then he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And as he's there, the dominoes of destiny begin to fall. Hundreds of Roman soldiers show up in the garden to seize Christ. Judas kisses him on the cheek with a kiss of death. Peter denies Jesus three times. The other disciples scatter. Throughout the night, Jesus is brought to and fro from one kangaroo court to the next, going to six different hearings in this one long night. Finally, Jesus' suffering begins to unfold. He is harassed, he is slapped, he is beaten. He receives 39 lashes, the crown of thorns pressed on his head into his skull. His beard is plucked, he carries his cross up Golgotha, up Mount Calvary, and there he is nailed to the tree. A lance is pierced into his side and his wound flows with blood and water. And finally, Jesus declares to Telestai, it is finished, paid in full. Jesus is taken down, buried into a borrowed tomb. He's cleansed, he's wrapped, he's coated with roughly 100 pounds of fragrances and preservatives. The tomb is sealed, Jesus is dead, the disciples have scattered, they all are hiding in fear. There is no hope. 
Some of you came in the room something like that this morning. Obviously not these circumstances from 2,000 years ago, but you come into the room today with the trials and tribulations of life piling upon you. Your marriage is hanging by a thread. Your children may be wayward. Your job is shaky. Your health is in demise. And you come into this building, this Lord's Day, of all Lord's Day, wanting hope. And I say to you this morning on the authority of Scripture, as we look at John chapter 20, if there is one takeaway from this glorious story, it is this. Since Jesus is alive, you can have hope. See with me first, beginning in verse 1, these reasons why we have hope, these reasons why hope is alive. See with me first, the empty tomb, beginning in verse 1, verses 1 through 8. The empty tomb. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark, and she saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Jesus rose on Sunday, the the first day, and that's why the early church began to, to gather and worship on Sunday and not Saturday, and named Sunday the Lord's Day. So the the earliest hours on Sunday morning, before the dawn of day, Mary Magdalene, she approaches the tomb. The other gospels tell us there are other women with her as well, four or more. And Mary is approaching, hoping to go into this tomb again and and to to care for the corpse of of Jesus, for Jesus' corpse, and put more spices, more fragrance, more preservatives on it. To do that, she would need these guards, these Roman soldiers who have rolled this big stone into place to cover this burial cave. She would need these soldiers to to roll it away so that these ladies could go in to care for Jesus' body. But there they go. They go up, and a funny thing happens. They see the stone is already taken away from the tomb. The tomb is open. Questions abound. What has taken place? Has someone stolen the body? Where is our Lord? Verse 2 tells us, she ran, she runs, comes into Simon Peter and the other disciples whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So, so Mary Magdalene's running out. She bumps into Peter and John, and at this point, the lights have not come on. They're scared, spitless, thinking that someone has taken Jesus' body, and perhaps the Roman authorities are pursuing them as well. Peter and the other disciples, verse 3, they went forth. They're going to the tomb. The two are running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first, and there they go to look in. The ancient world, uh, the Romans and the Greeks cremated the dead. The Egyptians embalmed the dead. The Jewish people would wrap them in clothes and, and anoint them with spices and place them in a tomb such as this. Verse 5, these disciples, they they look in, they see the linen wrappings lying there, but they did not go in. They see the grave clothes lying there. Simon Peter, verse 6, came following him. He entered the tomb. He sees the linen wrappings laying there as well. The face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciples who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. This other disciple is John. John does not refer to himself in his gospel. He refers himself typically as the disciple whom Jesus loved or the other disciple. And so John enters, they enter, and for the first time, the lights go off. The prophecies that Jesus has spoken about his own death and burial and resurrection comes together. And John remembers sayings that, that Jesus made, like in John chapter 2, that if you destroy this temple and in three days I shall raise it again. And so here these disciples are, they're standing there at this tomb, and as the story unfolds, more will come, more will come, more will come, and the question that was asked that day and that has to be asked this day is, what happened to the empty tomb? Where is this body? We go to visit cemeteries, we visit graveyards, we go to see our loved ones, we go to the burial places of historic figures because there's something intriguing, there's something inviting about going and paying your respects to the loved one who has passed, keeping flowers fresh at the grave, and then when we're traveling about to go to see where President Kennedy is buried or Abraham Lincoln is buried or some other great national figure, 
But here these disciples are. The tomb is empty. Many people have went to great lengths to try to explain why the tomb is empty. The first century, some argue that the the Jews took the body. They took the body out of the tomb. Really, that's interesting. So a bunch of Jewish disciples are going to steal the body out of the tomb, and then systematically all of them are going to be put to death. They're going to be martyred for a lie that they know to be a lie. Or perhaps the, the Romans or the Jews took the body. Really? So the Roman authorities or the Jewish uh, leaders would, would permit the crowd to think that Jesus is alive? Heavens no. They would have paraded his body through the streets to suppress this budding movement known as Christianity. Others have argued, well, Jesus had a twin brother, and the disciples took the body out of the grave, and Jesus' twin brother came strolling into Jerusalem about the same time, and people were confused and thought that he was the Messiah. Others have argued uh, the hallucination theory, that Jesus' disciples, they're all in a state of shock, and they're confused, and they're all hallucinating, and they think that the tomb is empty because they're hallucinating, and then this myth takes off. My favorite theory, and put favorite in quotes, is the swoon theory. Now, to quote a famous theologian, Jerry Clower, (laughs) the authors of the swoon theory have obviously been educated beyond their intelligence. They argue that that Jesus, after having underwent all of the suffering, the crucifixion, the lance pierced on the side, having been put to death by professional executioners, having been wrapped and buried in a cave for three days and caked in spices and all the rest, he had swooned. He wasn't actually dead. He had just fallen into a deep coma-like state. And again, these professional executioners, the Roman soldiers were confused. They thought he was dead. They put him in this burial place. And then after three days, Jesus resuscitates and he comes alive and he was never dead. He just resuscitates and comes back to his senses and he kicks out of these grave clothes and he pushes the stone away and he goes walking through Jerusalem with nail-pierced hands and nail-pierced feet, convincing the crowd that he has been resurrected. Brothers and sisters, it takes more faith to believe that than just to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. The empty tomb. We have hope this Lord's day because Jesus is alive. Notice also, secondly, verse 9, we have hope because of fulfilled prophecy. Again and again and again, the prophet spoke to the sacrifice of the Messiah. Again and again and again, Jesus himself, Christ himself, foreshadowed his own death. Verse 9 tells us, for as yet They did not understand, these disciples at first did not understand the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Don't turn there, but just listen to a few passages. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 28, beginning, or Matthew chapter 12, beginning verse 38, says this, He answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. And yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Other places like Matthew chapter 20. Verse 17 through 19, again, Jesus would say, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And they will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. Then, of course, John chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, where Jesus proleptically said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his own body. Jesus at Calvary, Jesus by raising himself from the dead, accomplished, fulfilled, countless prophecies throughout the Old Testament spoken of him and throughout the New Testament uttered himself, fulfilled prophecy. Many years ago, the country of France, the French statesman Charles Maurice Talleyrand 
was walking down the street and encountered a man who was seeking to start a new religious movement. This religious fanatic, seeking to start his own religious movement, ran up to the French statesman, Talleyrand, and complained that he could not get anyone to follow him. This confused individual asked the French statesman, well, well, what should I do? How do I get energy behind my religious movement? And Talleyrand replied, I recommend you get yourself crucified, then make certain you die. But before you do that, make certain you can rise again on the third day, and then you'll get some followers. Jesus is unlike any other man who's ever lived. Christianity is unlike any other religion that has ever been initiated. Why? Because it is predicated on a risen Savior. The empty tomb fulfilled prophecy. Notice thirdly, the eyewitnesses. Verse 10, we are told, so the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stopped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. They said to her, woman, what are you weeping? Why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus then said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. The voice of the resurrected Lord she recognizes. Boom, the lights come on. Energy fills the room. She sees Jesus standing there in all his glory. Verse 18, or or verse 17, Jesus said to her, Stop, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he has said these things to her. So who all did Jesus actually appear to? With whom did Jesus visit? Who encountered the resurrected Lord? Mary Magdalene, we see here. Some other women, Matthew chapter 28. Peter in Jerusalem on Sunday, Luke 24. The Emmaus disciples, Luke 24. Ten more disciples, Mark 16. 11 disciples, John 20. Seven disciples in Galilee, John 21. 500 at one time, 1 Corinthians 15, 6. James, the brother of Jesus, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Eleven disciples again in Galilee, Matthew 28. Eleven disciples again in Jerusalem, 40 days later, Luke 24, Acts 1. There were eyewitnesses. Now, without getting bogged down here into a big treatise on text criticism, let me just say this. The, the, The validity of the New Testament as assessed by any objective standard given to ancient documents, comes through with flying colors. This is the account of of who saw Christ. People saw him. They knew he was alive. And again, people may, may live for a lie, but people don't die for a known lie. The disciples, one after another, were willing to face the lion, to face the the stake, to face the fires, to face crucifixion, to face stoning, to uh, to to face challenge after persecution, after persecution, after challenge, paying the ultimate price. Why? Because they had seen Christ. Notice fourth. Fourth reason hope is alive, and that is changed lives. Verse 19, so when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, 
peace be with you. It's not incidental that the door was shut. This is John telling us Jesus and his glorified body enters the room without opening the door. When he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. They see him. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Hear this foreshadowing of the great commission that you will go, you will be empowered, you'll preach the gospel to the nations, to all people. Verse 22, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you, forgive the sins of any, if, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven. Them, and if you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Here, a, a reference to the, the, their, their responsibility to, to declare when a person has repented, to declare their sins forgiven, or if a person is unrepentant, to, to instruct them that they are still in their sin. Verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and put my finger in the place of the nails, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now, poor Thomas gets a hard knock. I mean, poor Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas. But you think about it, this, what is taking place is almost unbelievable. It's astonishing. And so, so Thomas is just saying, I, I want to see it. I want to believe it. I want to see it with my own eyes. So after eight days, verse 26, the disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger. See my hands, and reach here your hand, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. What a rich confession. My Lord, I surrender to you. My God, I worship you. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see me and yet have believed. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that they may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Again, what happened? The last time we saw this bunch, they were hiding in closets, in dark places, not wanting to be seen by anyone. Peter, the bold one, had denied Jesus three times before the cock had crowed. All of them have scattered. They're hiding. But then they see this resurrected Lord, and they are filled with power, with boldness. Peter shows up just a few weeks later and preaches at Pentecost this, this sermon marked by authority, whereby he, he, he charges the nation of Israel with the first-degree murder of the Son of God. What gifts? They have seen Jesus is alive. Harry Ironside was one of the great preachers in America in the 20th century. He pastored the famous Moody Memorial Church in Chicago for many years. And back in the first half of the, of the 20th century, he was traveling and he happened upon a Salvation Army gathering. Now, we think of Salvation Army in the year of 2018. We think of people ringing bells outside of the supermarket collecting change for dinner, uh, uh, collecting change for, for Christmas gifts for the needy. And, and good service they render, yes, but, but when they was founded 100 years ago, the Salvation Army was, as the name implies, a Salvation Army. It was a, 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 a gospel-speaking and evangelistic ministry to win people for Christ. Well, Harry Ironside is there, and, and the group saw this famous pastor come by, and they asked him to come up and give a, a word of testimony, and Dr. Ironside does. And as he's there giving a word of testimony, a, a well-known agnostic was there as well. The agnostic wasn't there to listen to the claims of Christ. He was there, just popped his head in to see and to sneer. He passes to Dr. Ironside an invitation to join him for a debate on Christianity versus agnosticism the next Sunday. 
Ironside takes the invitation while he's still on the stage. He, he looks it over. and There's a crowd there before him, the Salvation Army gathering. And he, he looks at the, at the invitation and he says, well, I have, a, I have a, a meeting about that time next Sunday, but I believe I can arrange to join you in this major hall for this. And we will announce the debate and when the two of us will gather and we will talk about Christianity versus agnosticism. Ironside said there's just one catch though. Before I agree to debate you next Sunday, you have to present two people with the following specifications. You have to present a man who is what we would refer to as a down and outer, a man who is given to, to the bottle, a man whose life is a wreck, a man who's, who, whose life has, has been ruined. But upon hearing a presentation on the value of agnosticism, his life was turned around, he has, he has turned over a new life, and now he lives a productive, healthy, happy life contributing to society. And then he said, and also you will have produced one other person, a woman. A woman who that we might refer to as a lady of the night. A woman whose life is a wreck, who has lived a life of, of sin and shows the effects of sin. But upon hearing you lecture on agnosticism, her life was turned around. And she gave up her evil ways and became a woman of joy and cheerfulness, living a life of satisfaction and happiness. If you can produce those two, I will bring them in by the hundreds whose lives were similarly broken, whose lives were a wreck. Yet upon hearing the preaching of the gospel of Christ, their life was turned around, brokenness turned into beauty, emptiness turned into joy, sin gave way to forgiveness, and now they live their life in a way that makes men marvel who did they meet. The agnostic said, nothing doing, and walked out the door. Ironside then looked to the Salvation Army Choir and said, who would join me next Sunday and testify to such a life change? And the crowd responded in rupturous applause, this is us, Dr. Ironside, this is us. I say to you this morning, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen who gather in this beautiful house of worship, you've come this Lord's Day in your Sunday best. And perhaps you come here to be, to be, to be re-engaged with the gospel of Christ. And I say to you, this book is true. I believe it from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. The gospel message is true that all who will believe in Jesus will be forgiven and have life eternal. And the only difference between the person who wandered in this day out of hope and the other people that came that have been coming to this church for 90 years full of hope is one word, and it's a man, Jesus. Do you want hope in your life? Hope comes through a person, Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning. Father, I pray this morning that the gospel of Christ would reverberate in our hearts. Father, I pray this morning for men and women who are here. Perhaps they've stumbled in this building today looking for something. And Father, I pray today by your grace that you would work in their hearts and that they would believe in your son and repent of their sins. Father, I pray today, I ask today, that you would work in our lives. Father, perhaps others today want to come join this fellowship or pursue baptism or just come kneel at this altar, make a fresh commitment of their lives to you. Father, I pray today that in this moment we would see this hymn of response not as a time to spectate about what others may or may not do, but a time to make sure that our lives are harmonized with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing out to the Lord a great hymn. Sing with full voice. If God has touched your heart today, you come. We'll be thrilled to receive you today. Lead us to him. God's
was raised by my grandmother from the time I was 15 months old until I was 12. I became a believer at the age of nine years old under her leadership and under her guidance. At the age of 12, I moved in with my mother because of a huge court battle. I then began to rebel. I started using drugs, being promiscuous, just dealing with things that I shouldn't have. I began to spiral so far down that I lost touch with reality and who the Lord was. During this time, I committed a horrible crime, aggravated assault against my aunt, and it was someone that I loved dearly. I got charged for a life sentence, and I served four years on 25 years. That was the darkest period of my life. I was in the worst spiritual battle of my life. I remember sitting in a jail cell, and I remember hearing the voice of God telling me to come back home. During prison, I knew the Lord was speaking to me about going to a different place, that I needed to change people, places, and things. I went to a place called Barry Treasure's home after prison. Clark and Valerie Rumfelt, two North American missionaries, came to Barry Treasure's home, and they asked me to stay and be a team leader for the women that were coming into the home. Right before I committed my crime, I had written a letter to God that I still have today. And God was speaking to my heart then, telling me that he was gonna use me to help people one day. And the Lord opened a door for me through Clark and Valerie Rumfelt. And Clark spoke to me and said, why don't you apply for seminary? What a changed life I am because of the gospel, sitting in the jail cell back in 2009. And here I am in 2018 and I'm a New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary student. I want to speak to those sitting on the pews, and I want to speak to those just visiting this Easter Sunday. I want to tell you that there is hope beyond just sitting out there and what you're doing, that Jesus Christ died for your sins. And if you know him as your Lord and Savior, then we are to put Christ on every single day. If you do not know him as your Lord and Savior, today could be the day that you come to know him.